Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrofil anbiya wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wahlul unqlatam min lisani yafqahu qawli. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, very good morning to all. Uh, welcome to this uh, program monthly lecture on Malay manuscript organized by ISTEC IIUM with the cooperation and support by the Malaysian Historical Society. So uh, this, the, the event today is the, in fact the second uh, lecture in this program. The first lecture was held some at the end of last um, January, delivered by our esteemed uh, uh, professor, uh, Professor uh, Midori from Sofia University, Tokyo, on the topic about Malay manuscript and other local manuscript that are available in Mindanao. So today is the second lecture in the series of lectures under this program. Uh, the topic for today, uh, I feel is very interesting because not many people know about the Malay manuscript available in South uh, Africa, especially in the Cape, uh, in the Cape uh, town area, where there are significant numbers of Malay resided there. And, uh, and they uh, moved to South Africa sometime in the 17th century uh, from what the region that now we call Malaysia and Indonesia. And as uh, the tradition in the past uh, happened, Malays and other sub-ethnic group in uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, when they write, normally they write in Jawi. Uh, I mean, it's Arabic uh, script and, uh, and using Jawi uh, language or Malay language. Uh, the topic for today is uh, Ajami or Malayu Manuscript at the Cape, returning to the South Africa's literary scene. It will be delivered by the renowned scholar from South Africa, Professor Muhammad Harun. His interest on Malay Manuscript is very well known. I personally remember when the National Library of Malaysia sent an officer to trace and catalog Malay manuscript in South Africa in the year two, in the year one nine nine six. There is uh, uh, the officer concerned uh, was uh, Madam Munazah Zakaria. Uh, he was sent to trace and catalog Malay manuscript in South Africa, and Prof. Muhammad Haro was uh, the the person that we contacted, and he was uh, very helpful in making the trip uh, successful. In fact, prior to this uh, visit, uh, Prof. Muhammad Haro came to Kuala Lumpur in 1984 to attend and deliver a paper on Malay manuscript in South Africa at the Conference of Malay Manuscript organized by the National Library of Malaysia. So I can say that among his many interests, his uh, scholarly interests, one of them is definitely Malay manuscript in South Africa. Uh, a short note 
on the presenter, Muhammad Harun was attached to the University of Botswana's Theology and Religious Studies Department from 2000 to 2020 and was a professor of Re religious studies at the university from 2016 to 2020. He was formerly associated with the University of Western Cape, where he taught Arabic, and the University of Cape Town, where he taught Islamic studies. Currently, he is a senior researcher for the Cape Town-based Al Jamaah Party, and an associate researcher at the University of State Stellenbosch, South Africa. He has authored and edited more than 10 books and editor of a number of journals. Before I forget, I would like to inform that the session is planned for two hours, one hour for lecture session and another hour for question and answer session. All the questions should be written in the chat box of the Zoom and YouTube. And Later, I will read them for the uh, lecturer or presenter to answer them. And now, I am very pleased to invite Prof. Muhammad Harun to deliver his lecture on the topic Ajami or Malayu Manuscripts at the Cape, returning to the South Africa's uh, literary scene. Over to you, Prof. Thank you. Okay. Terima kasih, Dr. Wan, uh, Wan Ali Wan Muhammad for the introduction. First of all, I wish to express my heartfelt thanks to ISTAC, to Professor Bakar, to yourself, and all colleagues there for having uh, invited me to join this particular forum. Secondly, I also just want to express my uh, gratitude to some of the my friends here in Africa Slatan who had assisted with some of the material, uh, Ibrahim Sali and uh, Dr. Dokrat and others, who basically, of course, are also familiar with, with aspects of, of these. Um, the topic that we are addressing uh, this morning is, is an issue that had been uh, tackled by a number of individuals, and we'll mention them as we go through the set of slides. Now, talking about the set of slides, As you will note when, as we go through the lecture, that we have quite a number of them. Uh, and this is partly because we try to cover all aspects as best as possible. But at the same time, we won't be able to do justice to each of them. So we'll try to uh, focus on some and then fleetingly go through others. But those that we're going to focus on are the ones that I feel are critical and important to share with you. And this will be particularly towards the end and at the beginning. So let me start off by, uh, I hope uh, I can share the screen, uh, uh, Dr. Wan. Is, is, has, has that been permitted? Uh, screen sharing to show my slides. I can't seem to... Uh, I, I, I wish to share my my slides. Um, they don't seem to appear on the system. I seem to have a technical problem this side. I'm not certain whether. Dr. Wana, are there any? Sorry. Let me, I have a technical problem. I don't know whether it is from my side or, let me see. I think it's okay. Oh, yeah. ah. Are they there? They, yes. There is, is, it, is, is it there now? Uh, are, are you able to, to see my shared screen? Yes, we can see. Okay. All right. All right. Sorry for the slight delay. Okay. Um, let me sort of just quickly give you a, a synopsis of, of, of what I wish to cover. 
uh, I will look at the connection between Southeast Asia and Southern Africa, uh, just locating it very briefly, socio-historically. Then we talk about the issue of language community uh, as part of that theoretical frame. But this theoretical frame is extended into the notion of scholarship, which we will sort of uh, speak about. Then I want to just uh, focus uh, a bit on the catalogs that have been compiled because these are critical um, reference uh, texts that nobody can uh, sort of lose sight of when they want to revisit this particular area. And then we want to briefly talk about Sheikh Yusuf and uh, Imam Abdullah uh, Qadir Abdul Salam, who basically were pioneering figures. And then, of course, we look specifically at uh, South Africa in terms of the Ajami manuscripts and then giving samples of those and then looking at the transition from uh, Malay manuscripts to Arabic Afrikaans. So there are these important developments that we need to consider. Having said that, again, we're just sharing you those uh, maps so that we can have a mental picture of the connection that, that basically exists between uh, our sort of regions. Of course, we're part of the Indian Ocean Rim. So inevitably, there has been uh, connections historically. Uh, archaeologists still need to do much more. And so um, uh, do we expect from historians and geographers because there has been movements between the two regions uh, over the many centuries. But let me quickly come to the notion of scholarship. We talk, when we talk about this particular field, we talk about scholarship about Ajami texts, which is a very specific area, and not everybody has an interest in it, unfortunately, but the value of this is enormous. And we'll try to share some of those points uh, as we move along. Uh, scholars, basically, who are they? Well, they are theologians, they are jurists. Uh, of course, in terms of the Arabic terms, they, uh, they are the mutakallimun or the fuqaha and so forth, who pen these, and they are the individuals who contributed towards the uh, formation of Muslim thought at the Cape and connect this with Southeast Asia in, in different ways, and we'll show that later. The other dimension is the scholarly outputs that exist. It started out as manuscripts, subsequently then as lithographic text, and then thirdly as uh, printed text. Way back to I've uh, worked on a bibliography on Muslim South Africa as a way of, again, give, uh, giving researchers a tool to work with so that they know what had been published and what haven't been published. So in that way, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but you basically add to what they basically uh, exist. Interesting to too, there was a text by um, one Hashim uh, and Hanafi Dola uh, quite a while ago on the Cape uh, Muslims, as you can see from there. But let me sort of quickly read part of the abstract that I have, and, uh, and then we will go through the other slides. Even though it has become widely known that South African Muslims, uh, sorry for this, that, that, uh, that South African Muslims' religious leadership contributed towards the development of South Africa's literary scene with its unique set of Cape Ajami Malayo literature during the 18th and 19th centuries, respectively. South Africa's specialists on literature continue to ignore this. And that's why we talk about reversing the literary scene, because this area is really it's, it's sort of marginalized. They have done so by not only treating it as an obscure marginalized set of works, but they have also disregarded its exceptional value towards religion and culture that are key ingredients of communities residing in Southern Africa, as well as societies living in Southeast Asia. Despite this genre's deliberate sidelining by these European cum orientalist oriented scholars, a few such as Van Salems and Hans Kehler realized its importance. And for this very reason, they wrote about them and we'll come back to them in a moment. While some of these scholars made certain efforts to catalog, like Harun and Haja Mohan Munazza, to comment on them, David and Karan basically made their contribution, and to critique them is Kaila himself and uh, Kies Versteeg uh, from Holland. There were others who chose to translate these texts. And one interesting uh, publication that uh, came into the book market in 2019, but because of COVID, uh, unfortunately, things were scuttled, 
is this particular book on uh, the, the the book cover as you see on on your on your right spiritual path spiritual reality selected writing of sheikh yusuf and this is the first time that the collection of sheikh yusuf's writings have been made available in english so i think it's a contribution that we need to visit uh, and my argument has been that it should have been published in south east asia instead of maybe uh, by unisa press that basically is not sharing it uh, as it should but be that as it may i also felt that there should have been, have been effort to trans have it trans those manuscripts translated into, into bahasa because the value of course it's in arabic because all sheikh yusuf's works are in arabic so that in any case that's just a side the issue but it's important let me come to the other part of the abstract the outcome of these studies demonstrated that this unique genre of literature cannot be ignored and that they must be recorded studied and written in a significant contribution uh, towards world literature in general and as part of South Africa's literature in particular and perhaps one can say southeast asian literature as well that said it should not be forgotten that some historians correctly so belong to the literature that were written in and transported from southeast asia so uh, that is an important uh, issue quickly just to another footnote is that this book has just come out evaluating sheikh yusuf makassar and imam abdullah tidori's writings uh, we're waiting for the hard copies from jakarta but we just want to share that but we'll come back to that if need be the third part the sort of uh, leg of this abstract is to link the absence or the presence uh, whichever way you want to describe it of these to the development of arabic afrikaans manuscripts which took place between 1840s 1950s and that complement the malayo manuscripts that landed at the cape between 1700s and 1850s now that in itself is a very interesting issue which haven't been explored and that perhaps uh, we will want to sort of talk about a bit more a fourth is to undertake a brief comparative view of at least two ajami manuscripts to not only establish the importance within the respective south african south asian literary scenes but also to stress their value in muslim thought and civilization now as we said early on language and community are two critical ingredients two critical concepts that we need to explore now bearing that in mind africa itself as a continent is a home of a plethora of ajami manuscripts when we say ajami in a broad sense of the word in a sense that it takes into consideration the word makua kua for example northern mozambicans they also wrote their manuscripts in their local language the fulanis in uh, west africa they also wrote it in their language and so we can go on the list and these are two books that basically do so community languages established in port again we want to quickly just talk about those that the cape itself was a potpourri of communities and so in a sense people came with own languages they brought them when they were enslaved when they were exiled so in that sense the issue of languages mix and this is what we observe also in the manuscripts that we sort of uh, find uh again on the sort of notion of uh, community this contribution the notion of pluralized linguistic culture uh, emerged as we sort of move along in other words across the two or three centuries that we as we look back we find this sort of having taken place and this in itself uh, makes it a fascinating area for linguists uh for language uh, sort of uh, translators and so forth just to see the the sort of the the way the the language grew and how language itself in this case afrikaans sort of emerged from two communities uh into what it is basically today and of course the afrikaner community only acknowledge that uh of late because they did not know that afrikaans itself was written in that but we'll come back to that point uh, later again the issue of language shape ethnic religious racial identities and they reflect socio cultural understandings and they express religio political ideological positions so these are all mixed as we know into language and language is a very sensitive sort of uh, aspect of human uh, of 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 communities uh, for numerous reasons we're not going to go into that as we had already mentioned during the voc period that is the uh, for enough or uh, the 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 dutch the 
Dutch East India Company, when they were controlling South Asia, there was a pool of languages. And of course, when they were controlling the Cape, local language such as Sanhui, the Bantu, and imported language such as your Dutch, your South East Asian languages, and so forth, all were spoken uh, at the Cape. By the 19th century, there was a shift in that. And then by the, of course, the 20th century, we see this uh, having shifted even further. But these are sort of, it just gives you uh, as, as a, a basic idea. You may also conclude then with the point of language itself, language policies, as you can see from this diagram, shifted. For example, from the 17th, 18th century, local language of Dutch, slaves and exiles, mother tongues. Then you move later, the Dutch becomes the dominant language with local languages and exile language also being subservient, so to speak, to it. Then by the uh, 19th century, we find English or the British taking over, Dutch becoming secondary. And now in the 20th century, we find, of course, a shift in that. Having said that, let me come to the other important theoretical sort of uh, uh, frame. Talking about scholarship, scholarship itself is sort of uh, a fascinating area that has developed into something that we all, those of in academia, have experienced. There are different dimensions of this. And I, again, go to Boyer, who has uh, contributed uh, quite interestingly on the subject, but we're not going to go into the points that he raised there. But I just want to share it with yourselves so that you understand that for us to engage with manuscripts itself, we need different people to come together, people from different disciplinary backgrounds. And this basically tells us why we are maybe especially in the language, we need somebody in history, we need somebody in geography, we need somebody, so in other words, we need transdisciplinary uh, scholars, multidisciplinary scholars, because this, these manuscripts are so valuable, so important in terms of not just our identity of, uh, of Muslims, but of communities in terms of how they themselves transform themselves because of these manuscripts. And if it had not been for these, the argument goes, then we would not have been where we are, so to speak. In other words, they lay the necessary foundations for intellectual uh, transformation uh, and developments. So the scholars whom we had mentioned early on who really played a critical role in this whole process, the first person to come to is Adrianus van Selms. Van Selms uh, wrote a book entitled Arabic Afrikaans, I just translated Arabic Afrikaans, uh, sort of a, a catechismus, a, just trying to look for the English word, but uh, so basically a two language uh, uh, text. So he himself was among those, of course, he comes from Holland, he settled in South Africa, was a professor of Semitics at the University of South Africa, and he felt he needed to engage because he was quite surprised to find these and he therefore contributed to it. The other person was Hans Scheler, a German scholar who came on a trip, who was attached to one of the, I think to Hamburg, if I'm not mistaken. And he produced a very valuable piece of work uh, compared to uh, Van Salem's in trying to identify many works in Arabic Afrikaans. So, of course, and some of these he also then realized were in Malayo. So he notes that in this particular text. So it's a very valuable text, which I think will be great to have be translated from German into English uh, for a wider audience or, or even in Bahasa. But unfortunately, it's out of print, but it's an extremely important text. One important individual whom we cannot miss in this whole discussion is Ahmad Davids. He was a social worker by training and then subsequently moved slowly into the academia. And he was among those who really explored this area in a very uh, sort of intellectual way. In other words, he tried to understand what made the Cape Muslims tick. And one of it was the language use, how they made use of this language, Afrikaans, how they creatively transformed Afrikaans itself. And this is how he made his mark. The two books that basically appear on our uh, on our left-hand side, the one was edited by Professor Hein Willemser and Professor Suleiman Dango, where they collected all sort of uh, his ideas and basically put it in, in one text. And then the other one is an abridged version that appears in Afrikaans. So when we talk about manuscripts, 
a number of things that we can think about. Manuscript cross borders. They reach communities. They teach fundamentals. They mentor youth. They train leaders. In other words, the the uh, sort of quality or the, uh, the, the, the credentials of a manuscript is much more than what meets the eye. And I think this becomes more and more important. Uh, I just take my cue from Parpustaka Nagara's uh, Malaysia's sort of definition. Malay manuscript as handwritten works in Jawi, script produced in the early 16th century to the early 20th century. Malay manuscripts are written on materials such as paper and so forth. And we're not going to read everything. Knowledge recorded in Malay manuscript covers subjects such as literature, history, and so forth. And what we note when we consider this definition, it applies to what we find at the Cape. And that's the reason for making reference to that. So the Ajimi scripted text is a centuries old, as we all know, and it's found in Africa, it's found in sort of South Asia. So there is a uh, interesting, and of course, one would like to know whether South Asia's influence is also found along the East Coast of Africa, because even Swahili, as you know, was written in the Arabic script. And Makua, as we had said early on, which is uh, just the southern part of Tanzania, northern part of Mozambique, where there's a community that is told. That unfortunately, the community has been described as extremists and so forth, which is totally nonsense and bunkum, uh, partly because they are a poor community and has never been given the necessary share of the wealth in that region, but that's a side issue. Um, just in terms of the subjects that have been covered, of course, I think I found this on uh, Brite Harian's uh, website, uh, which just gave a synopsis of the, the type of themes that have been covered from Quran, Tawheed, to Fiqh, and, and, and so forth. And so this is also what we basically came across uh, yeah. Interestingly, the Indonesian embassy in 2006 had a seminar where a few of us participated and, of course, trying to also grapple with the uh, issue of manuscript at the Cape. While that was indeed an important uh, contribution, again, uh, at that point or up to that point, there wasn't another catalog in sight that captured what Haja uh, Munaza basically did. So Munaza's text remains a very critical piece in terms of research. However, and but be, before we come to the other catalog, let me quickly just say, what did she cover in her uh, collection? She basically had Ahmad Davids, whom we re referred to. He had six uh, sort of, he had uh, sort of uh, 13. I Okay, maybe I should explain the numbers there. First of all, there's, we counted about 70 manuscripts that she could identify that are part of these individuals' catalogs. Ahmad Davis basically, uh, she listed six, but then there's basically, if you look closely, she basically has 13 uh, and not six as such. So it's double that number. There's a Muhammad Hilmi Hartley who had four, Dr. Kasim Darcy who had seven, but in essentially is eight and so forth. A point which I just want to make at now, but I'll come back to later is that Dr. Darcy and the South African Cultural History Museum and Haji Hussein Alawi, each one of them have fascinating uh, manuscripts uh, where there's only one copy at the Cape. And that makes that copy extremely valuable. Now, we are not saying the others are not. What we are saying is that the mere fact that you only find one uh, reflects or relates some idea, but we will come to those ideas uh, a bit later. Then there's the Nur Haywood collection that had 10. And that differed from the catalog by Dr. Mukhli Spayeni from Indonesia, whose catalog uh, we've, again, maybe I should express my thanks to Dr. Siaril uh, from Indonesia's uh, University of Indonesia, who shared with me this uh, scan copy last week. Uh, so in a sense, I looked very late at this, but an interesting uh, set of, of, uh, of collectors that uh, he uh, was able to identify. Some of them are in the other catalog, but there are others names that only appear in this catalog, like Yosenda Davidson, Yusuf Akhadin, Benjamin Kali, uh, and Ibrahim Hassan. So I have gone through it and basically... Uh, 
as noted from the top, there are 114 manuscripts, but in one case, it's sort of uh, one was uh, appeared twice. So it's 113 manuscripts that uh, Dr. Peony was able to identify. But we'll, we'll sort of come back to, to some of these. The important thing that, that one has to ask as one moves into this particular arena is, why has this Ajami tradition taken off at the Cape, for example? Who were the key figures? Uh, when did this process begin? What were the contents of these manuscripts? Which from among these are popular and which were less popular? And why we raise that question? Because we find some of these manuscripts appeared sort of, in other words, there are eight copies, and that's quite a, quite a few. And what one would like to encourage future researchers who were able to identify and find these copies to compare them and to do a critical edition, because that's also very helpful, as we know from the scholarly arena, for those of us who are involved in manuscript uh, um, writing, uh, so not writing, but in editing, that that in itself becomes an important uh, volume then. Where were they copied? Lithographs, cyclostyle, all of these are important questions that sort of uh, one grapples with. How do they manage to write these in challenging circumstances and so forth? Now, again, they come to another, uh, all of these, in a sense, essentially, a part of the knowledge production process. And for one as a researcher, not to overburden one with theoretical frames, but it's also helpful just to have knowledge production as part of that, that frame, because one has to understand who was the person who initiated the writing of the manuscript and then who copied it and for which target audience and during which period. All of these are interrelated questions that I think uh, are useful. And this is just repeating the, the previous slide. What is of interest and which I, uh, which uh, just before we basically officially started, when I spoke to Professor Bakar about this is the issue of that many of these manuscripts are in the hands of families or individuals and families. They have not been collected and put in the museum or in the uh, state library where they should be. And two reasons for this one, at least it is in safekeeping. Two, that they are preserved, conserved by the uh, people who are familiar with manuscripts because we know uh, that they're brittle and they can disappear over time. And oh, maybe a third, two, is that so that the family members don't fight over these. As you all know, that when they're in families, the one son or the one daughter or the cousin or the nephew would say, but that is mine. And we don't want people to fight over a valuable text that contributes to the identity of the community at large. And unfortunately, whatever said is basically what we experience. Coming now more specifically to the Cape, what do we find? We find at the Cape, of course, Arabic was familiar amongst those theologians and jurists, those trained, but the manuscripts also reveal that some of them were written in Bukhis, some in sort of Malayu, and some in Sundanese or one of the other local languages. Of course, not many, but the point of the matter is the mere fact that they they were they are to be found is a reflection that all of these languages were pretty active at one stage in the history of the Cape Muslims. Now, I, in a sense, want to describe these as traveling manuscripts. And the reason for that is that many of them were not necessarily written at the Cape, particularly the Malayo texts. They were brought either with the exiles or with those who were enslaved. So, uh, or maybe with others. But the point which we need to bear in mind that these were what one can describe as traveling because they move from one region to another region uh, and how they became valuable to those communities who were the receiving communities who were basically now the new emerging community, how they were able to engage with this. So the emerging scholarly theological circles and information networks then basically emerge. And one of the key dimensions of all of these, and as you yourselves know in South Asia is the Sauf, the Sufi orders, Sufi scholars 
had and continue to have a critical role, despite what we know in contemporary uh, situation of the Wahhabi men, the sort of uh, approach to sort of uh, Islam and understanding. I think our communities have moved far beyond that because of these uh, Sufi uh, scholars. And we can always talk about that again. The outcome of their interaction is the production of religious knowledge. They authored them, they copied them, circulated them. And this is basically what we find. Just to reinforce this idea of copiers and authors and, uh, and for the Cape, uh, and now that one looks back, these manuscripts have helped to shape the Cape Muslim intellectual outlook in a subtle way, not in a very uh, visible way, in a very open, tangible way, but in a subtle way, partly because the manuscript came not at one go to the Cape, they came over time. And over time, we find that people develop their thinking based upon this, and we'll sort of come to those when we look at the examples of the manuscript. And as you all know that these are the sort of uh, various themes within the sort of manuscript tradition, the siyat, the hikayat, dini, risalat, and tib, and so forth. Now, those are to be found at the Cape too. Now, but let me get back to Southeast Asia in a sense, and why is this so necessary? Because we cannot understand what happens at the Cape without having a knowledge of what happens in Southeast Asia. So what happens in Southeast Asia? As you all know, Sheikh Yusuf was exiled to the Cape. The question is, did he write his manuscript at the Cape? The, his response is, no, he did not, which meant that he wrote all his manuscripts whilst he was back in South Asia. So that is the one. Uh, Palembani's texts are to be found at the Cape. How did it arrive here is the question. So we will come to that again. But interestingly, all the scholars that have made an impact via al makassari via Al-Palembani, and Fansuri and others, people like Samarkandi, people like Al-Ghazali, Ibn Arabi, al Sanusi, And it is fascinating when one looks at these individuals. And just a quick footnote, in sort of more than 20 years ago, I did a text on Samarkandi without having realized that he had a manuscript that was translated into Afrikaans at the Cape. So what does this tell us? And of course, as you can see, he's a 10th century scholar pretty old compared to others who, who come later. And so the impact of these, uh, of Asama Kandi was indeed, in a sense, um, enormous for the small community that, is, uh, that was here. And now, leaving that aside, let me sort of just quickly then uh, move on. Now, when one talk about intellectual development and lineage, I think we cannot uh, rule out, we cannot, we should not overlook the interconnectedness of scholars and how these scholars' ideas traveled uh, to South Africa. We're all familiar with Aranri, we're all familiar with Al Qurani and the students. And of course, there's debates. Uh, if when one looks at uh, Professor Azra Azumardi's text, very, very interesting sort of work that helps to collect connect all of these networks, uh, how maybe Ranri's influence Sheikh Yusuf, but then some say that uh, Sinkili was not necessarily a student, but some of his ideas might have trickled down. But he was, of course, a student of Qurani. But also interesting is their students. Uh, we know that there's, of course, um, I'm just trying to, uh, if, if we look at Burhanirun uh, Ulakan, uh, al Menkabawi. He himself has been involved in Sinkili's works, uh, Tarjuman al-Mustafid, for example. And the question is, have these works found their way to the Cape? Interestingly, indeed they have. Asirat al-Mustaqim of Aranari has been uh, found at the Cape. Mir'at uh, al uh, or Mir'at al-Muhaqqin, of course, of Sheikh Yusuf, have been found here. Tarjuman al-Mustafid, that one I'm not certain about because I haven't been able to, to closely look at the uh, tafasir or those copies that are here, but I'm sure that there is a connection. So, Ran indeed is a figure and his figure, his contribution found its way and even Bustan 
uh, as salatin uh, that features here have been found in the cave. So the question is, how come these basically uh, are found here? Why? Of course, we have more questions than answers. Nonetheless, I think it's an interesting transferring of knowledge, transfer of ideas, trans uh, sort of influencing ideas from Southeast Asia uh, to the Cape and how the Cape itself tra transformed itself because of Southeast Asia, that interconnection. So we all are familiar with the important knowledge centers, Banda Aceh, Palembang, uh, Banjar Masin, all of these were important on, and all of them in one way or another find the ideas filtering down or traveling across the ocean to the Cape. So we have, for example, important figures now. Uh, my friend Ibrahim Sali, who was an archivist and an uh, early Muslim historian who has been doing lots of fascinating work, can maybe fill us with many more names than the ones that we have here. But the point which I mentioned, uh, why I mentioned him is part because he had be able to identify a long list of others. And the, the, and the reason why I'm mentioning it's partly to do with have some of them not been bringing these manuscripts to the Cape? Have they not been carrying them, traveling with them? And so that could be the case because some of the manuscripts that we have listed are not necessarily, didn't come with Tuang Nuruman, for example, or with uh, Imam Abdullah of Tidori. So, but the point is that that these manuscripts are there. We have, uh, let me qu quickly just start with the 17th century. We all are familiar with, again, we mentioned that early on, Sheikh Yusuf al makassari was exiled in, 90, uh, in 1694 and died in 1699. So he was here for a short period with family members. And the, as we had said early on, he did not write any of the manuscripts here, but basically uh, from outside, but these might have come along with him or these might have been kept back there, but I think we're all familiar with, with his sort of many writings and his uh, sort of great great granddaughter. I don't know how to describe, but she, uh, Munaza, uh, sorry, not Munaza, sorry, um, Dr. Sahib uh, has completed a thesis not very long ago through University of Africa trying to uh, reflect on the contribution of Sheikh Yusuf. But that aside, the text of uh, Imam Abdullah is one of the most important local texts. In other words, Atidori was exiled to the Cape and then he wrote these whilst he was imprisoned. And if one looks at this tome, it consists of various manuscripts. And one of them is uh, Kashur Ikram. For example, uh, a text that uh, basically has formed part of his collection. But the title for his collection was known as Ma'rifatul Islam wal Iman, which is in fact only a part of it. But it's a useful word because of the overall understanding of word Ma'rifa. Then, of course, we have 19th century, we have two important works. The text by Al Qaul Matin, we'll come to uh, in a moment. And then Abu Bakr Efendi's Bayanuddin, which was written. And these, both these texts have been written in Afrikaans. And so this is where the shift takes place from Malayu text to the Afrikaans text. And that is what we basically try to reflect in this diagram. When we take the Jawi uh, Ajami text, 17th, 18th century, they were essentially Malayu texts. But then the shift takes place in the 19th century. And of course, by the 20th century, we uh, have only Afrikaans texts. So there has been this sort of movement that we have to bear in mind. But let me come back and repeat to an extent which I'm doing uh, the points made earlier. And that is, when you look at the 17th, 18th, 19th century in the diagram on our uh, left, we have the following questions asked. Who brought uh, Aranir's uh, as Sirat al-Mustaqim to the Cape? Who has an interest in Akhbar al-Akhirah? Uh, al al Who had an interest in Dalail al-Khayrat of Imam Jazuli? What about Tufat al-Raghibin of al-Banjari? All of these found their way to the Cape. So why were they copied? 
for whom, how many were produced. And, and this is part of our sort of uh, engagement. And to how many copies were there? And this is what we, and we basically found some interesting uh, results. Um, as you can see, these are just selections of manuscripts that were in circulation at the Cape, your Kashfut Ikram, your Kifayat al-Muhtaj, Sabil al-Muhtadin, Asrat al-Mustaqim, which we had already mentioned uh, more than once. Important, again, just from a purely theoretical dimension is that when we talk about traveling manuscripts, we have to bear in mind who the author was, we should, if we have knowledge about who the copier was, and then have knowledge who the collector was. Unfortunately, uh, both catalogs that we basically uh, referred to do not talk about the background of each of these collectors. For me, uh, as, an, as a researcher and interest in manuscript, just want to know how did the collector, the owner, uh, get hold of these? Because you can't just get hold of it you know, from the sky. Somehow there must have been some interaction with somebody before them or in their family or some friend of theirs. So that is an important. The other is how did these manuscripts influence thinking at the Cape? The text itself, how did the teacher get hold of the text? And how did the person who was inducted, who was nurtured, was mentored, who was guided, basically, how did he or she, if there was she who received this knowledge, how did they make use of this? So that being the case, let me come to the most inspirational, I say most part because he was, uh, of course, not the only one who exiled here, but because of his stature back in South Asia, uh, being a mujahid of sorts, but also a scholar at large, Sheikh Yusuf stands out. And of course, basically his light uh, sh continues to shine, so to speak, in our hearts, partly because of the contribution he had made. And as we had said early on, the uh, two scholars edited a selection of his writings, and of course, contributed by uh, a number of other scholars to basically give life, so to speak, to what he had written in English. So in other words, one get a sense when you read this text in English, for those of us who are not able to read Arabic, at least as to what he covered, why he did, uh, why he wrote what he did and so forth. So Sheikh Yusuf is the one important person. The other is Imam Abdullah ibn Qadi Abdul Salam from Tidori. And so these two lay the foundations of this emerging community that, and of course, we talk about emerging uh, in that period, in the 18th century, and into the 19th century. And then subsequently, we had other scholars as we, the names that we see on our right. Many books have been written on Sheikh Yusuf by now. Uh, myself and Dr. Wan uh, Ali basically are busy sort of uh, working on a bibliography, annotated bibliography on Sheikh Yusuf. And uh, that, of course, we can all share at some other occasion. But we just want to underscore the fact that Sheikh Yusuf will become an uh, important focus of research, not only, of course, in Indonesia and Malaysia, but also here in South Africa. But I think lots of work have of late been done uh, on him, as you can see from these uh, texts. Uh, this is just part of my study. Of course, it's thought to be, be changed, is the writings that have uh, appeared over time in terms of the contributions that have been made on him and about him. This is a text, Asir Asrar, uh, which has been translated into English and, and into Bahasa, I think, uh, from the text that you see from Angasuna and others. Uh, and then there's a text of commentary in Arabic uh, by Sheikh Rahim Din Nawawi al Bantani. Uh, I've been trying to get hold of the text, unfortunately, I haven't, but uh, because of, of the interest uh, in Sheikh Yusuf, these basically stand out. Coming back to the book that I mentioned earlier is this particular important compilation of translations. Uh, and so when one talks about, and I want to quickly just comment on the issue of translations uh, before we sort of go on to this list that we have here. Many of the texts that we have, and I'm sure some of you might have the same experience that, that these texts that were written either originally in Arabic were translated either into Basa or the, in our case, they were translated into Afrikaans, but of course using the Arabic script. 
So it makes these scripts unique in the sense that they have a text in an Arabic script, but in a different language, whether it's Malayo, whether it is uh, Bukhis, whether it is Afrikaans. That is the one. Second thing is, these texts have also allowed the mere fact that you translate is also to a degree a way of interpretation because sometimes you cannot capture one word uh, in the original language in the other or in the uh, target language. And as a result, you've got to explain what is meant by the word in the target language. So there are these differences that one has to bear in mind. So the issue of translation goes along with it, but there's also a degree of interpretation that also accompanies it. And these are issues that one has to bear in mind. Now, these the names of these uh, manuscripts that we have here listed. These are just some, by the way. We haven't listed them all. Uh, let's go to our, our right. These are what we call common manuscripts. There are more than two at the Cape. Um al-Barahin. Now, uh, I, I come back to this one because I, I sort of try to explain this one a bit more. Bidayat al-Mubtadi by Sheikh Muhammad Saleh Rawa according to one uh, interpretation, then there's another interpretation saying, no, it is by Al-Banjari. So there are different opinion as to basically who the author of this particular text was. But be that as may, there are copies to be found, more than two uh, at the Cape. Al-Sirat al-Mustaqim, there's also three, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, of this text here. Then there's Kifayat al-Muhtaj by Sheikh Dawood ibn Abdullah al-Fatani. Then there is Al-Banjari's text, Tuhfat al-Raghibin. And one of the interesting texts, uh, we have more than nine copies, if not ten. There might be more than that, but uh, from what had been listed in the catalogs, is Hukum al-Aqli. Now, Hukum al-Aqli is, in fact, taken from Um al-Barahin by al -Sunusi. And Hukum al-Aqli becomes seems to be a popular text that have been moving around in the hands of, of, of the Cape Muslims. Those where we just have seem to have one copy from according to the current uh, study is that Akbar al-Khaira of Araniri, Kashf al ghimma uh, and then Masail al-Mubtadi, and Dala' al-Khairat, and of course Bustan al-Salatin that we had mentioned earlier on. They now the point we want to make, whilst all of them are unique, despite the fact that they are more than one, because important, uh, and I'll come to examples of that, of Hukuk al-Aqli, that uh, why each manuscript is unique on its own, but what is of importance here is that if there's only one, you cannot compare it with any other, and that makes it a very rare text uh, at the Cape. One can perhaps compare, say, with those manuscripts back in, in, in South Asia, or maybe in Southwest uh, Asia, that is, when we talk about Southwest Asia, we talk about Arabia and Yemen and so forth, but I think uh, it's important to bear in mind. May quickly just give you an example of some of the manuscripts here too. I've tried to just list uh, some of them in terms of dates. Uh, we have, we'll, we'll come back to uh, Sifadu Apulu. Uh, we have Hukum al-Aqli, for example, uh, we have manuscript that is dated 1809. Now, if it, the question, two questions, or of course, more than that, but two or three questions that one has to ask. Was this manuscript copied in 1809? Or did it land here in 1809? That is, when you say here, I mean, okay. Uh, so in other words, you have questions that is difficult to answer, but will have to sort of move back into his state, find ways of trying to prove that, for example, it is a, a manuscript that was uh, copied here or copied elsewhere, but in 1809 and found its way to the Cape. Idah al-Bab, Idah al-Bab, it's a longer sort of title. There are two copies. And by the way, the, uh, the fourth column are the owners or the collectors the one is Haji Hussein, for example. Then the other one, NH, is Nur Haywood. Uh, then there is uh, Muhammad Lutfi Ibrahim. Uh, some spell the I with the E, so Ibrahim. And then there's Dr. Kasim Dasi. I just use some of them 
there are others, of course, but I just wanted to give you an uh, idea of uh, the collectors, but more specifically the dates, so that we can see that the sort of 19th century period, we're talking about the late 18th century, early 19th century, that there were a pl pl plethora of manuscripts at the Cape, and these were critical for the transformation, intellectual transformation of the Muslim leadership. So you have that as 1809, you have Kifayatul Muhtaj, 1809, you have Umar, uh, there's a copy of Umar Brahani, um, uh, Barahin in 1823, and so forth. So in other words, and of course, Tukhfa al ragibin we find uh, two dates. One, of course, one assumed the 1774 uh, was when it was penned, but 1870 is a copy of that. Uh, and so forth. So one can go through each of the others and basically uh, um, sort of comment on those. The second column uh, are, the are the folios, the pages. I don't like to use the word pages. It comes from the word manuscript. So we talk about folios. For example, Hukum Akli, there are a number of copies. As we had said, we just use the samples. 34, the one has 34, the one has 41, the one has 76, the one has 20, 128. And this could be because of the um, of the of the number of lines per, per per folio, so in some cases spread out, in some cases it's written very uh, tersely, very tightly. So yeah, these variations. So, but what we see here, Sarah Salikin, for example, has is quite a tome, and again, it'll be great for some scholars who will have the opportunity to look at them and to try to study them in terms of the history, in terms of the content, in terms of, and comparing to, to others. If there's no other copy uh, at the Cape, then of course one will have to go back. Like uh, in the case of Kashrul Rima, there's only one copy. So one has to compare it with uh, those uh, elsewhere. Let me now come and, uh, and give you specific examples. Asanusis Umar Barahin, uh, Barahin is, is indeed one of the critical works that influence and Ahmad Davids and uh, Professor Uwais Rafudin have been exploring the Sanusi ideas at the Cape uh, in their own sort of way. So their contributions have to be taken into account when one looks at sort of this development. Interestingly, very re recently, two or three years ago, I think I think Che, I'm trying to get to the person's name, scholar from Malaysia who also did a study on Umar Bar uh, Barahin, again, from there, one was able to also gauge some of the, Im the impact it had had even at the Cape, though he does not talk about the Cape, but uh, the importance of this particular work. The point which we make on, on our left is that this was a North African scholar. It moved across North African desert, so to speak, moved to South uh, sort of um, West Asia that is finding its way to Mecca and Medina, and then from there moving to South Asia and to, to Southeast Asia. So it traveled a long distance in terms of its contents, in terms of its ideas, and of course the impact has been lasting. We ourselves to this day uh, have learned from the Sanusias text, and we we'll come back to the subtext that we will sort of come to in a moment. Now, these are the subtexts that we sort of, that we were able to gauge from what scholars, other scholars have been saying. That when you look at Umar al Brahim as the mother text, it had the subtext. Hukum al Akli is one of them. Bidayat al Mutari is yet another. Sifat Duapula is yet another. And then Atiyat al Rahman is yet another piece. And of course, we try to describe each one of these. Uh, in the last uh, column there. Atiyat Rahman, for example, there's no other copy except this copy is one of, uh, in the hand of one of the collectors. That makes it also extremely unique. As we had said, Hukum Akli, there are nine to ten such uh, copies around. Bidayat al Mutadi, a limited uh, number. And then Sifa Dua Pula, there are maybe four or five. Uh, to be found. And we'll sort of come back to these, to Hukum al Akhli and see how in, in a moment. The, uh, I just sort of use this just to share with us the, 
the beautiful writing, of course, but also the manuscript itself, very clear from Snook Kronja's uh, collection, um, just to give us some, some idea of the, the text that we are talking about, not the printed one, but the manuscript itself. The other point I just want to highlight is the fact of the point which we, in a sense, shared with you a moment ago, the traveling dimension of the manuscript. Sanusa wrote it in the 15th century. It found its way in the 16th and 17th century to, of course, from Klemechen or Tilmisan to Makkah Medina. Then, in turn, it found its way into the Malayo Archipelago, South Asia, South Asia, and of course, eventually, by the 18th, 19th century also, it landed up at the Cape of all places. And of course, some say even uh, along east coast of Africa in the Makua speaking community and elsewhere because Sanusi's impact seemed to have been uh, so deep and so dense that all of these communities, all our communities were in one or another effect and influenced by his ideas. And we'll come to one of these in a, in a moment. And this is basically this particular text. Umar Barahain, it's Sifa Duwapulu uh, text. Now, when we were, this is a personalizes, when we were at Madrasa in the 1960s, we were all told to learn what we say in Afrikaans, the 20 Sifat, the 20 attributes, which is this um, Sifa Duwapulu. And this is a popular subject of Malay text and, of course, popular at the Cape too forming an essential part of Muslim theological teaching. So we were all brought up to focus our minds on these 20 attributes of the Almighty. And in this way, we have been convinced about the attributes and about who God is and our understanding God uh, as our creator. So it really impacted on our psyche and of course, this filtered down to the communities as such. And in this way, it stands out to this day. Many different compositions on God's attributes, both lengthy and abbreviated, that are written in both prose and verse are to be found. And of course, we uh, encountered that uh, here in the Cape. You mentioned Elion Akbar al Akhira, uh, Rani's illuminated manuscript, that this, these photos that you see here, this, uh, this copy is to be found in the Cape, and this is also found in uh, Munazza's uh, catalog. Uh, other two that were found, Sarah Salikin and Hikad Nabi Buchukur, basically is also, uh, also texts that are basically, and uh, Hikayat Nabi uh, Buchukur basically is, this is the only copy. There's no other copy to be found in the Cape. But let me come to two or three other examples as we move towards the end. Malayo manuscripted texts the Ayat Lima Blas. Now, the Lima Blas verses, as we all know, these verses possess extraordinary properties that can make it easier for one to achieve the desires that one wants, and so forth. In other words, there are specially selected Ayat that people and individuals are encouraged to read and to repeat and so forth for different reasons, whether for healing purposes or whatever, but they have become very popular. And this is one sample that we have here to get as you can see the, from the title, it's in, uh, in Malayo, it's not in Arabic Afrikaans, and that, of course, makes uh, the difference, and this belongs to that unique set of manuscript. Again, we're not going to go to each of these, but I think these uh, slides just give us a taste of what these um, set of manuscripts are all about. These are all the verses that uh, are containing that uh, um, set, from Al-Imran to Al-An'am to Takwir and Abbas and so forth. And so we can sort of look at that. But let me come to the text, Sifa Duapulu, uh, that was extracted from Umm al-Barahin. Uh, we basically, of course, these are samples from elsewhere. And I think anyone who goes to the Asian African Studies blog at SOAS uh, will find an interesting set uh, sorry, at the, at the British Library, we'll find an interesting sort of material there for uh, on manuscripts. <clears throat> Quickly, just on Hukum al Akri, uh, of course, Hukum al Akri basically um, is, of course, in terms of its theme, it's 
is compared to say, how does it differ from hukum adi or adat or hukum shari? So there are these variations. But I want to come to the samples that we have. As you can see, there are two different samples here. Uh, the one uh, basically uh, is in the hands of Nur Hayud, another in the hands of another uh, collector or owner. And so, as you can see from, the, from these examples, the handwriting is different. So they are therefore different to anybody who, of course, who knows Basa well, uh, classical Basa, so to speak, can and compare these and produce an interesting study uh, because unfortunately, and this is the point which I want to make, that many of us don't know Bahasa uh, um, and therefore we need uh, to cooperate with scholars from South Asia to pursue these particular areas and to produce some interesting studies. This is just a sample from the previous one where the, the folio one and folio two is, uh, is shared. And this is uh, Noor Haywood's uh, collection. Uh, he has a different uh, um, copy, as we can see from if we, one compares the, this one to the previous two that we basically showed. And then we want to quickly come to another Muqaddimat al Mubtadi. Uh, unfortunately, I was unable to really uh, find the author as such, although. Uh, because there is the Muqaddimat al-Mubtadi and then, of course, there is Bidayat al-Mubtadi. So there are these various uh, manuscripts that, that we have here. And, of course, um, whether they are exactly the same and whether it is uh, one attribute to uh, uh, Sheikh Baba Dawood al-Rumi, of course, these are all uh, need to be explored. But I think they are important to bear in mind. Let me come to Arab Afrikaans as we move towards the closure. The, we mentioned this early on that in 1850s, uh, it was discovered, it was found that this particular manuscript was making its rounds as a lithographic text. I have a copy of it also with me, but there are others also of lithographic text but not in the original manuscript form as such. However, the point which you want to make with this, as you can, if those of us who try to read what is here, will find that they wouldn't be able to make out unless they know Afrikaans, because it's written in Afrikaans. Uh, and so this particular text is an indication that at that point, we're talking about the 1850s, there's been a gradual shift from using copiously Malayu to the use of Afrikaans. So Afrikaans now become a dominant, a dominant language within the uh, community as such. This is another, uh, this is the sort of the first folio of, of that particular um, text. Again, if we, uh, if we try to read, of course, the Basmana, and then you'll find that it starts off with Afrikaans uh, and so forth. All right, so I'm reading Afrikaans because that's what we, uh, that's a language that has been used, but in the Arabic script. Now, just quickly on sort of the whole genre of Arabic Afrikaans, that text known as Al-Qawl Mateen, as you can see the transliteration here, in the, the first one, Gablul Matim, Gablul Malin. Of course, these were taken from earlier individuals who've been writing about this who were, were unable to really decipher the sort of the transliterated sort of words. The person who did the lithographic work was Johan Sochen Gefell. And of course, uh, we have a translation of this in Arabic Afrikaans in 1910, Afrikaans as such. And <clears throat> we have people like Sheikh Abu Bakr Ibn Abdullah Abdraouf, who basically had a copy of these, or to whom this was attributed. The person who did the study of Arabic Afrikaans, we already introduced you to him early on, that is Adrianus van Salems of 1953. And then 
Subsequently, very interestingly, about this very text, uh, Professor Weiss and Ahmed Davis entered into a debate as to the authenticity of this particular work. And of course, we're not going to go into that, but the very interesting debate that took place then. And of course, Ahmed's understanding of the community and the use of the language uh, in the Arabic script basically shed some new light onto um, the evolution uh, in terms of the language of the uh, Muslim community. These are just samples of Arabic Afrikaans words. Uh, unfortunately, they're very small, but I just wanted to share this with you, but more in, in transliteration form. We find that the community, of course, of late, there has been what we call a process of Arabization. People have become more um, Arabic conscious, so to speak, in terms of the word usage. Instead of saying tramakasi, we say shukra. Uh, or instead of saying tulis, of course, we now use the English word right and so forth. Uh, puasa, we still sort of uh, some, our generation and earlier ones still use. The word jambang has now slowly moved out. The word kali used to be used. That's also slowly disappearing. The word lambar to, to be engaged for marriage is also used. Uh, the word mantra uh, for azimah was also used. And of course, the word miang. Uh, incense uh, sticks are so very much used in, in some. So these are interesting examples again, and we have other uh, lexical structures that we want, for example, Krislam, Kunvay Salam, Tom Kubur, the grave digger, Khutba, uh, he gave a sermon, or Khasalat, he performed Salah, Sumbayang, uh, and Abdasplek, place of Hudu, Bukate, time to book fast. And so forth. This is a, just a list by Kotsi, and I'm not going to go into that. But this is a text of uh, Abu Bakr Effendi's Bayanuddin, the first two pages, as I say pages, because it was printed in Istanbul, uh, again, uh, giving an, an understanding of, of Islam. And of course, he was a Hanafi trained scholar. And of course, it is important to, to also take that into account theologically, because most of the Cape Muslims, one can still say, are Shafis. Of course, they are Malikis now, they are Hanbalis uh, and others. But the dominant school is the Shafi school. So with his intervention, it brought the Hanafi more into prominence. And we're not going to go into that. The other sort of texts that uh, are around, like Kitab al-Ilm al-Faraid, Masail Abi Layth al-Samarqandi, uh, and Al Muqaddimah Al Hadramiyah by Sheikh Ismail Hanif, uh, who basically wrote this in 1928. He only died in 1958, and he wrote Arabic African texts almost up to the period he had passed away. These are two samples, uh, cover samples of two texts the one by Sheikh Ismail, whom we just mentioned, as we can see, Al Ma'araj uh, Al Qawim. Uh, and then we have Su'al wa Jawab by Sheikh Ahmad Bihadin, uh, who was also one of the prominent shiuch uh, at the Cape. Just to round off, we talk about Mus'hafs. Um, there has been, there's one or two such Mus'hafs around. Uh, I haven't been able to see them as such. So uh, one needs to sort of have a look at them to see whether they associated with the um, tafsir text that we mentioned early on, or whether it's a totally different one. So we need to sort of explore this. But important to bear in mind that at the Cape, people like Twanguru, or also known as Imam Abdullah, wrote from memory uh, a copy of, of the Quran. So there are extant ones, three of them, as far as I'm, I understand. And one of them are in the hands of the family, the descendants of uh, Tuanguru. And uh, it is indeed an important um, um, copy uh, that is around. Interestingly, at the end of this particular, this particular copy, it is in Baasa, as you can, for those of us who, of course, are able to read it, we can see that, that the scholar, the person who basically did this, project basically uh, was familiar with the 
a language as such and thus end it. Just to basically end then, the uh, Afrikaans Language Museum was set up in PAL and this was partly to celebrate the Afrikaans language. Uh, Ahmed David was the one who argued in the late 1990s that this uh, particular monument should not have been in PAL, but should have been in a book up. And this is because of the contributions that the Cape Muslim have made towards the Afrikaans language without the Afrikaners knowing that another community was basically using the language in an active way and writing it using the Arabic script. And in that way, of course, made their mark. What are we saying with this particular presentation, we say that another effort must be made to locate all of these manuscripts in whichever way possible. The next step is to digitize whatever uh, manuscript we find, so at least we have digitized copies. We have to update and amend and correct catalogs that have been published, like the two that we have, or even articles uh, that appear that were incorrect, because in some cases, there were articles that were written that catalogued some of these, but there were incorrect uh, sort of points that were basically made. We should encourage families to have their set of manuscripts stored in libraries, particularly state library, support students, researchers to basically study these, to chronologize these manuscripts. Now, we've tried to do that uh, in our small way, not necessarily successfully, but it's a way of giving us a sense that when we talk about the 18th century period into the 19th century, that there has been lots of these manuscripts doing circulating. And their circulation meant that there was an intellectual vibrancy of sorts, uh, theologically or from a fixed side. So in that way, it stirred the minds of those who basically were able to read this text, were able to learn this text, were able to circulate this text. So they are important. As scholars, we need to examine these manuscripts from various dimensions to offer a broad understanding of the contents and the contribution. We need to check if there are additional copies with which to compare. Like we said, Hukum al-Akli, we have a number of them. So one will have to sit down, compare the sort of these particular texts, see how they differ, where they differ in terms of words, in terms of sentences, in terms of translation, in terms of misinterpreting, whatever. But I think that becomes a fascinating area, but all of these contribute towards understanding this early uh, Cape uh, Muslim community. Check if there are additional copies uh, out there. Produce a critical edited edition, something that we mentioned earlier, accompanied by a translation and commentary. These should appear both in English and Bahasa. And then, of course, we need to cooperate. We need to really work together uh, as academics uh, to because after all, we might lack in certain areas, but the other one, the other person who works in this cooperative project might have those skills. And in this way, we can work together to produce something that belongs to us all and not just to one particular community. Because when you look at the influence, the influence is from outside in, and it is within this community where this transformation has taken place, the intellectual, theological, fiqh uh, sort of transformation that I think even our community is not very familiar with and needs to be, and this needs to be uh, spoken about and shared with. Rawakasi to Istak for this opportunity. And in Kosi, thank you, shukran, thank you. Uh, we end our presentation there. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, to Prof. Uh, Muhammad Harun for the very uh, interesting and illuminating uh, lecture on Malay manuscripts in South Africa. Because uh, it is interesting to know that even in South Africa, there are Malay manuscripts there. To the extent, if I'm not mistaken, written there, there were more than 100 titles of Malay manuscripts. So now we open, uh, we come to the question and answer session. Yeah, okay. Prof. Osman would like to uh, uh, ask a question. Please, yes. 
All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Wan. Um, I would like to, first of all, to thank uh, Brother Professor Muhammad Harun uh, for your presentation. It's a very, very informative uh, information. Um, I come to learn uh, quite a good number of things. And of course, secondly, also to thank you, uh, to congratulate you for the uh, very important work you have been doing. Uh, regarding the manuscripts, the Malay manuscripts in the South Africa, not only the manuscripts per se, but you know many many other issues related uh, to those uh, manuscripts. Um, I remember when um, I went to Cape Town in 1994 to celebrate 300 years of the arrival of uh, Sheikh Yusuf Makassar. I met. Oliver Ham, brother uh, Ahmed David, mm -hmm. whose photo you showed. And he told me at the time, I mean, the, he, he says, yes, uh, written a master's thesis already about the African language being uh, written in Jawi. All right? mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And he also talked about uh, many, many Malay words which entered into African. Uh, but at the time, the thesis was not yet. Uh, well, I, I don't know, has that been published? That because I was interested at the time, I, I was at the University of Malaya at the time. So when I came back from Cape Town from that visit, uh, I took initiative, uh, you know, to ask uh, the language center or the University of Malaya to undertake mm -hmm. a few things. Uh, Unfortunately, that, did, that didn't happen. I already got the allocation money, allocation, I got the, 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 the person. Uh, no, one, one uh, lady, a scholar to go there, but, but that didn't materialize for some, for uh, some reason. So I don't know whether there's been any development along that line. First of all, we need to publish that. Maybe it maybe has been published already. If not, we should, I think. And I think uh, uh, maybe, you know, Istek uh, uh, can, you know, can, uh, can try to, you know. Uh, first of all, right, uh, pro, has it been published, uh, Prof? Yeah, yeah. It, uh, in fact, that uh, that photo I, sh I showed you early on. Oh, I see. Uh, next, yeah. So, so that was basically his thesis that was that was turned into a, a book. All right. So, so at least it uh, brother happen. Azman, I see you in the library. I think we should uh, we should get a copy of the book in our library. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Inshallah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah. Inshallah. All right. Now the. Um, re regarding the uh, the what I call this the, the the issues that followed up or rather that mentioned by Doctor Wan, uh, I just want to follow up on those things. I think the I agree. Uh, we should um, uh, this you know uh, push this project of uh, digitalization of the Malay manuscript in 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 South Africa. I think uh, based on our past experience when dealing with manuscripts uh, owned by families, I think that the, the attitudes of the families are not, are not uh, monolithic in a sense. They, are they have different attitudes. Some, I think some, uh, given the right amount of money, they will sell. But of mm. course, uh, which means that we have to, to, to pay some money. Number two, yes, maybe some, they say they do not want to, for sentimental reason, maybe more that, mm -hmm. they do not want to depart from those manuscripts, but they may be prepared, say, for, for a, a little you know, amount of money to allow us to digitalize. I think that, that, that is, that's something that we need to, to, to look at. Huh? So, so mm -hmm. I think this uh, is that should, certainly is that should take up this uh, with the library. Uh, and pursue this uh, uh, this thing, and um, uh, well, I, I the other one, of course, I, I I'm a support of the idea of uh, Professor Muhammad Harun himself, you know, uh, to somehow to to arrange uh, for him to uh, you know to undertake some project at uh, any stack is something that we have to have discussed at the. Uh, management level of 
of, of uh, which day. Yeah. Uh, as I see, yes, I mean, uh, another thing, uh, all this while when talking about the Malay caves, you know, we know also there are Malays, small uh, Malay community, Malay Indonesian community in Suriname. Have you, you know, in, in terms of literary link, and is there any link between Malay cave and the Malay in Suriname in Latin America? Uh, there's no. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, just just on that uh, score, no, there's no link. Uh, although there there is familiarity with this, particularly via Holland, because uh, some of us who had gone to Holland realized that there were those who were in Suriname. Uh, so in that way, but there's no sort of a social interconnection of sorts uh, in any way, unfortunately. Uh, but I suppose that can be explored uh, in different ways. But just coming back to the, the point you made, yes, I think the issue of monetary, uh, if we put a monetary value on a manuscript A or B or C, of course, sometimes that value might not be, uh, be able to really capture the, the value. But be that as it may say, it's a way of maybe attracting an interest to saying, look, uh, why not part with it? Because uh, we will put in a library, We'll care for it. It will be there for, for generations to come. And in that way, but I think these communities, these families need hard convincing. In other words, you really have to be a, a good negotiator and arbitrator of sorts to, to tell them, look here, these are valuable uh, pieces of, of text that you have in, in, in your family and they can disappear. And unfortunately, sadly, some have disappeared uh, as we talk. I mean, this has now been for two, three, four decades, and, and this has been a concern. I mean, we're talking now two, three decades down the line uh, since uh, Monaza's text almost. Uh, and the second one has also come out by uh, Dr. Payeni. And the issue is when is there going to be a concerted effort made to really secure these? And even our local government hasn't succeeded. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll have to just seriously think about this and as you suggest, maybe to see how we can proceed uh, with the various ideas on the table. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh